Hello and welcome to the Social Work Grand Challenge webinar on COVID-19, learning from history about disaster and economic inequality. I am Jenny Romick from the University of Washington. I am a co-chair of the Social Work Grand Challenge on Reducing Extreme Economic Inequality. I am WebExing in today here from my living room, um, but more importantly, from the traditional and modern lands of the Duwamish people and the Coast Salish people here. So I'd like to recognize the land on which I um, work and live. Um, welcome to our webinar. I will fully admit off the top that um, this is the first time this group has done, this particular group has done a webinar. So thank you in advance um, for patience with any technical difficulties that may arise. And I will remind my fellow panelists that I, for some reason, am not able to see your chat. So if you need to tell me something, you can either wave and tell me out loud or um, have Dominique send me a text. Um, so thank you. And um, thank you all um, for attending today. We had over 200 folks registered for this. Um, we will be recording it and um, placing it on the Grand Challenges website. Um, if there's content in here you'd later like to share with coworkers, colleagues, or students. Um, I will introduce, oh, and I also wanted to give a special thanks um, to students and a special welcome to students in the University of Washington West Coast Poverty Center seminar who are attending today as part of their ongoing seminar, which I usually teach in person, and now I'm teaching via webinar, as many of us am. Um, I'll introduce our panel shortly, um, but I also wanted to introduce two of the faces you see here who made today's work possible. Um, thank you to Kira Silk, um, who's there on my screen, could be anywhere on yours. Um, Kira is the director of the Grand Challenges for Social Work effort um, based at the University of Maryland School of Social Work. Um, and thank you also to Dominique Crump. Dominique. Dominique is a 2019 graduate of the MSW program at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. Um, and she works with the University on Community Engagement and works um, with our Grand Challenge on Economic Inequality. Um, in terms of, um, sorry, thank you for your patience here as I go back and forth. Um, for technical questions, if you have questions about hearing or seeing, um, you can use a chat function to contact the host. Uh, Kira and Dominique will try as they're able to help you on that. I understand WebEx also has a, a help function. Uh, we will be doing a Q&A at the end. Um, and as you have substantive questions about the presentations, if you have questions for Michael, for Trina, for Laura, um, please use the Q&A function there. Um, we'll be compiling those throughout the talk and hopefully having a chance to address at least some of them at the end. So. Um, All right, before we begin, however, I wanted to briefly overview the purposes of the grand challenges of social work, um, and particularly our grand challenge on economic inequality. Uh, the grand challenges is a program of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare, um, and it aims to coalesce our field around 12 big cross-cutting issues facing the world today. Um, and in the present moment, so many of the grand challenges, ending social isolation, um, thinking about decarceration, thinking about technology are really more important um, than ever. So the grand challenges effort is a, is a call for researchers and practitioners uh, to work together and to tackle these tough problems. Um, and one of the tough problems in the US today is persistent and extreme economic inequality. Uh, the top 1% of the wealth distribution owns half, nearly half of the total wealth in the US, while we have approximately one in five American kids living in poverty. And these are the pre-COVID-19 numbers. Um, the consequences of this great inequality for health and for well-being are massive, and yet the inequality is, is growing wider. Um, our grand challenge on reducing extreme economic inequality 
looks at both inequality in income and inequality in wealth. Um, and as we've been meeting regularly um, as a leadership team and just talking about the events of the day, uh, we realize there are a lot of ways in which the economic effects and the health and social effects of the novel coronavirus and the COVID-19 pandemic um, may be amplifying um, existing inequalities. So as our country faces this unprecedented set of events, um, we as social workers and social welfare scholars um, want to be thinking carefully and thoughtfully and also broadly about our public policy actions, what they mean to economic inequality and human well-being. Towards that end, we have two speak three speakers today um, talking about previous challenges in American history and how we did or did not respond to them in ways that pr promoted economic inequality. Um, so in order of which they'll appear on our program, we have Dr. Michael Sheradden, who is the George Warren Brown Distinguished University Professor at um, Washington University of St. Louis. He is also the founding director of the Center for Social Development at the Brown School of Social Work at Washington University. Uh, we have Dr. Laura Lane, who is Professor of Social Work and Social Welfare and Anthropology at the University of Michigan, as well as Dean Emeritus of their School of Social Work. Um, and finally, we have Dr. Trina Shanks, who is a Professor of Social Work and Director of Community Engagement at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. Uh, so our first speaker, is Dr. Michael Sheradden. Um, we have been arguing. He thinks he has 25 minutes to talk. I think he has five minutes, um, but I'm going to start my stopwatch and advance my slides, Michael. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny, and thank all of you for joining uh, the discussion. I, uh, Jenny, Jenny, give me five minutes or whatever go over here, so I'll, I'll move pretty quickly. Um, so we, we've been through a, a period of increasing economic inequality really for several decades and uh, and now we have an economic health and economic crisis is going to make this uh, a lot worse. So it is a it's an important time to, to raise these questions and talk about what we might learn from uh, similar crises in the past. So um, so we're going to touch on on several of these topics and and in my in my uh, discussion today I'm going to talk a little bit about the Great Depression. So the Great Depression, as you know, was a, happened in the 1930s, started in the fall of 29. Um, there was massive unemployment, 20, 25% unemployment by some measures. Um, and um, it, it, this was an extreme period of this before the federal government really had uh, hardly any programs to support people. So basically, much of what we think of as social policy or social welfare policy was created in this crisis. Uh, and it's important to understand that because it really is in periods of crisis that major policy changes happen. Before, before the depression was a, a, a era of reform in the, in, the, in the reform era, early part of the 20th century. Um, but, the, but the depression really was, was created, uh, Social Security Act of 1935, which for the first time started to provide some retirement to uh, to people, uh, retirement security, unemployment insurance, aid to mothers uh, that, that were supporting uh, dependent children, uh, and, and aid to the disabled, aid to survivors if a breadwinner had died. So there was a whole, a whole structure of policy and really a whole structure of labor protections at the same time. And if you look just just to your to your right over Franklin Roosevelt's shoulder is is um, Francis Perkins, who was Secretary of Labor at the time. This, Francis Perkins, literally a giant in social policy in America, um, didn't didn't promote herself in that way, but create what was the primary mover in creating the Social Security Act and creating the whole structure of labor protections that we still have in the United States. Frances Perkins is a social worker. Uh, she was also, there was another social worker, Wilbur Cohen, uh, who worked in the White House with Roosevelt, who was also a major architect of social security. In Washington, D.C., there are buildings named after both Perkins and Cohen. I think these are the only two social workers have federal buildings named after them, uh, but it gives you a, 
a sense about the role that social work has played in these in this major policy period. The Social Security Act, as, as we talked about, was just a, a, a absolutely transformative policy shift. So in addition to, next slide please, in addition to uh, the Social Security Act, we had a, a lot, we had massive unemployment at the time. And so uh, Roosevelt and Harry Hopkins, and Harry Hopkins is shown here with Roosevelt, he, he was sort of right hand person to Roosevelt. He ended up running the Works Progress Administration. Harry Hopkins also a social worker. Um, and, and under Harry Hopkins was created the WPA. Next slide, please. Um, and the WPA was a, a government works program, a job creation program. And the language that sometimes gets used today is a guaranteed job for all or, you know, work for everyone, right to, you know, right to work in a positive sense, not a negative sense. Um, and um, and this, this was, this, this employed, WPA employed million, literally millions of people at a time doing public works in America. Uh, next slide, please. Also created the Civilian Conservation Corps, a similar idea, but, em but employing uh, younger people, uh, mostly younger people, uh, in conservation work in, in, in rural areas. I did my doctoral dissertation on the Civilian Conservation Corps, so I, I uh, know, it, know it pretty well. Um, it, it, this, this also massively important public program that, that really transformed the lives of these young people, enabled them to get through the depression, and their and 25 out of their $30 a month went home to their families, also supported their families. Mm -hmm. WPA planted more trees than had ever been planted in the history of the country before, and it built literally almost all of the state park infrastructure in the country. WA, or CCC buildings are still uh, very apparent in, uh, in many of our state parks. So these are these are massive social interventions that that were created during during that crisis. So so I would like to I would like I'm probably using four of my five minutes already. Uh, next slide, please. So so I would just like to throw you know urge us to think about large scale policy change. Uh, we're going to need universal health care. Uh, this 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 seminar is not about that. Uh, but we'll focus on the economic side. So some kind of large economic policy change is going to be required. Um, there are several candidates for what this might be. The most, the most well-known one is probably universal basic income. The idea of providing some basic income to everyone uh, on an on a ongoing basis. Another, another idea that's similar is a jobs guarantee. So this is work, this is like the WPA and CCC a job for everyone who wants to work doing constructive work. Uh, and another one is one work that, that we're working on a lot on universal asset building. So everyone is building up some assets or some resources or the language that Jenny used of getting some wealth that they, can, that they can accumulate so they don't depend solely on monthly income, but have some resources for security and for long-term investment. So are these are these crazy ideas? I don't really think so. I think I think we can do these things. And I think if this if this economic downturn goes on long enough, we will do them. Um, you remember that Franklin Roosevelt wasn't didn't come into office until more than three years after the depression began. So if there's a long enough period of hardship, very major policy change is possible. And I think we should be ready for that. Next slide, please. So one idea, can you, can you advance the slide? Working on it. Okay. Well, one idea is that we could do something like a global civilian conservation corps. Uh, so my, my, my notion is plant 1 trillion trees. It turns out if you plant 1 trillion trees, it will take all, all of the carbon out of the air that has been introduced since the Industrial Revolution. This is by far the easiest and most efficient way to remove that carbon. And, and, and this, there's, this, there's evidence here, this is, a, this is a Swiss university, Zurich ETF University that did these studies and, and, and made, made these estimates. So we, we can, it's possible. It is not crazy to plant one trillion trees, but you have to be organized and it has to be global. So I think also in the, in the 21st century, we no longer have the luxury to think about 
national social policy. We have to be thinking about social policy that actually has a global footprint because we have global problems to solve. And climate change is one of them, and massive inequality is another one. Uh, pandemics is another one. Uh, it's, it's, it's time for the world to cooperate beyond national borders. We have a lot of work to do to figure that out, but it's time to do that. Now, one idea is to use military organization, which Franklin Roosevelt did for the CCC. You've got all this, you've got all these armies standing around. Why don't you use them? Why don't you use that capacity and the, and all of that, all of that infrastructure to do something worthwhile? not just throw, you know, be dropping bombs on other people. But this is this also a little bit of a stretch and it's risky, but it's, it could be done. Um, so there, so this is one idea that I, I, I would like to see develop in, in the next, next years ahead and, and possibly it will be. Uh, next slide, please. So the next, the next, uh, the next idea is to think about a way to build assets for everyone. So, we're, we've been working on this research and, and policy innovation for quite a little for quite a little while now. So, um, and we have a we have a kind of foothold on this policy by starting every baby out with an account uh, in which in which he or she is building assets. So this is child development accounts. We have a very large research project uh, in in Oklahoma now. Trina uh, is doing a research project in er, following up on a research project in Michigan also on child development accounts. This is this is really excellent social policy research. Very rigorous methods, positive results that are affecting state policy. Next slide, please. So, so CBAs now are defined and demonstrated. We have demonstrated an effective and sustainable policy structure. We have demonstrated that we can include everyone. We've demonstrated that the policies can be progressive and they will have to be much more progressive in terms of building assets for the poorest uh, children. Uh, and, and also with these policies, we have broad political support. During a time when there really is, there are very few bipartisan efforts in the country, but child development accounts can attract support from both Republicans and Democrats. Next slide, please. So, so our, my long-term vision for this, also very uh, romantic, is you know a, a, a child development account for every kid on the planet. Uh, this is, this also is within reach. It's not we have the technology now to do this. It can be delivered over a cell phone. Um, but but there are of course many many political and economic issues to solve in between. But I think we should. What I'm message for my little talk today is we should to be really bold about these ideas, not think in terms of, oh, how can we help people a little bit, but how can we actually change the way things work? So, so this is another, this is another idea that has that potential. One more slide, please. Oh, this, we were doing a research in, in several uh, countries. Th these are, these are uh, kids in Ghana who have a savings account. Uh, and I like the picture because the kids look so joyful, are so joyful and healthy. And um, so this is another, Ghana doesn't yet have a child development account for every kid, but, uh, but the president has announced that he's interested in this policy. Uh, there is an international network. This is a meeting in, in Singapore in, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and these are all people working on child development accounts in various countries. Almost all of them are social workers. You need to know this and, and be proud of what social workers are doing. Okay, I think that's all. One more slide. So the message is here, we can learn from the past and try to shape a better future. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much for the, the history and the future here. Um, our next speaker is Laura Lane. I thank you too, Michael. That was terrific. Um, I'm going to be talking about a very different kind of disaster, looking at the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And I'm an anthropologist by training, so you're going to get sort of an anthropologist's eye on this. I was working and living in Austin, Texas, when Austin received uh, about 10,000 evacuees. And it's the aftermath of the Katrina for those evacuees uh, and the experience of what happened in Texas and in Austin as we dealt with that, that I want to talk about. And 
I think this is in a way a flip side looking at what happens when there's a relative loss of federal national cohesion around planning for a disaster and where that leaves people, particularly people in poverty, how it can accentuate um, the kinds of inequality that existed beforehand. There's listed on the slide there three kinds of studies that we did and the source for those, but I'm not going to uh, spend time describing those. We'll, we'll go on to the next slide. I want to look at four kinds of um, questions very briefly. Uh, the first question. Laura, or, you yeah. may have just put notes over top of your um, camera. Okay. There we go. There we see your face again. Now you can see me. Okay. I'll watch that. <laughs> Um, who is in harm's way? As you're looking at the onset of a disaster, can you foresee who is going to be hurt by it? What happens in a decentralized response? What happens if there's a very la a lack of coordination, a lack of shared resources, and a lack of shared understanding about what needs to be done? In that kind of condition, what happens to the funds that are put forward to uh, contribute to people's recovery afterwards, and what responses seem to work when and for how long. So that's what I want to be concentrating on. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. So first of all, Katrina was a really uh, vivid example of places and people who were in harm's way. As many of you know, when the uh, hurricane hit, uh, New Orleans, that's, this is a map of and the surrounding area, flooded and the flooding continued for many weeks, as a matter of fact, uh, as the flood prevention system, the levees, broke down. But what we found there is if you look at a map in terms of how much water there was, which is equivalent to sort of how far under sea level that building was, and also look at maps of household income, you find that they match very closely. So communities in New Orleans were built, in a sense, in harm's way, closest to the flood prevention system and in the lowest lying land. They had poorer quality housing that was more easily affected by the waters, and they were in, a, in the areas of the city that were more subject to environmental pollutants uh, and those pollutants got into the flood waters, making it ever more dangerous for people. So there was that kind of infrastructure. It was also the case, uh, there were other kinds of attributes of people in low-income low communities, and particularly communities of color, which was the nature of their um, employment. And that that employment uh, was very tied to place in New Orleans. And the poorer you are, the more likely you were to have jobs that were tied to your network and to being close to where you lived, and the less portable those jobs were. And I'll be coming back to that uh, in a minute. Okay. What happens when you face that kind of a situation, receiving 10,000 refugees into a city uh, and we have at that time, uh, as many of you remember, there was a very uh, disjointed federal response. Uh, FEMA, the national agency supposed to do this, was very late in coming in and changed both its rules and the way it was handling the situation uh, uh, almost on a weekly basis for the first four or five weeks. Um, over the preceding several decades, we had been in the process nationally of doing what some people call devolution, taking programs from the federal level and pushing them to the state level, which often in turn pushed those programs to the local level, so that whether you got child care support was a local decision, how food stamps was handled was a state decision. And these kinds of decisions uh, were meant to increase local control, citizen involvement, and service design specific to the community, left uh, service agencies and left the whole community, in fact, without the value of government, federal government resources, the kind of money they could bring to bear, the kind of broad coordination they could bring to bear, uh, the, the kind of research that comes needs to come forward when you face unforeseen problems, and the ability to track the problem. Uh, as, as background information. Next slide, please. 
<clears throat> Meanwhile, the evacuees that came into Austin had a whole series of complex needs related to that particular problem, some of which we were in very poor position to address. Uh, so part of it was uh, one of the issues is that many people came in with no identification at all. They had no way of showing who they were or what they might be eligible for. And to act that even more difficult, the major source of new identification, getting that uh, birth certificate uh, flooded out in New Orleans and it, people were unable to request replacement identification. If you think about being a stranger in a strange city, arriving with nothing, and not being able to prove who you are, no access to medical records, no access to financial records, no access to anything, you can see how difficult it was for people to stabilize themselves at all and for people to receive help. Uh, and so there were a whole series of basics that were very difficult in addition to the fact that most of the people who were evacuated as far away as Austin uh, after the uh, hurricane came in with a series of problems, many of which had prevented their uh, evacuation prior to the hurricane, they had also gone through a very chaotic evacuation in which they lost test touch with family members and with the networks that supported them. And they also, uh, found that their survival strategies, the kinds of jobs they had, the kinds of services they were used to using, were not available to them in Austin. Social workers, too, were having a very difficult time. Thank you. Um, and Laura, we're continuing to not be able to see your video intermittently, oh, so. I got to do this differently. Thank you. For I, I think we were seeing a close up of your sweater for a while there. <laughs> Uh, the, um, during the first four to six weeks, there was a huge effort to get people at least into safe housing, to get their basic medical care taken care of, to get medications they needed, uh, and to begin to help uh, stabilize their children with children's, uh, with schooling or child care. And in a sense, if that had been the end of the problem, if people had gone back home, we in Austin would probably have been patting ourselves on the back for a job pretty well done. It was the aftermath, the fact that this was long term and involved unanticipated problems uh, that meant, led, led to a real great period of uncertainty. How long was this going to last? Were we trying to move people here? Did anybody know how to do that with 10,000 people all at once? And following that, by the following summer, a period that appeared to be one of real fatigue and disillusionment. We didn't know how to do it, and things weren't going very well for the families. It was easy to blame families in that kind of condition, to not <clears throat> to realize that we didn't know what to do, so what was the use of serving them or trying to serve? And we started, in a sense, losing clients from many agencies. They either moved, uh, to get somewhere else where they might get a different kind of help, or they simply lost touch with helping agencies uh, entirely. Next slide. This is my second to last slide, and I think it's an interesting picture. Um, I was showing this to my daughter who actually helped me design it, and she said, yeah, that's the slide that you present because it's uninterpretable and, unex and, uh, <laughs> and ununderstandable. This is a slide of the flow of money into Austin to help families after Hurricane Katrina. FEMA money was not yet flowing. And what you see on the left hand of the slide uh, are symbols for every major charitable organization that was sending money to Austin. Organizations like the Red Cross, the United Way, Lutheran Social Services, Catholic Social Services. They were all trying to send funds in to help out there. These funds became so complicated that the second column over that just has four entries in it were the conglomerates that the funders put together to release the funds that they couldn't manage themselves. Those went to conglomerates, the next column of three entries of the organizations, and those conglomerates 
fed most of the funds out to the agencies that were doing on the ground work with evacuees on the right side. Uh, not all funding followed that route. And the important thing from the point of view of practitioners to realize is that every funding stream had a stop start time, a stop time, and a specific goal. And if you were serving a family, you needed to know which agency had control of which stream that provided which good when. And social workers said that over the first four to six weeks, their whole workload shifted to understanding family needs, to understanding where you could go get those needs met in this truly incomprehensible system. So what, what did I see in terms of preparing for the next disaster? First of all, that there is a clear role for the federal government and we lose badly and we treat people badly if we don't have a preparation at the federal level that tells us how to do this. We also are very dependent on universal basic services that don't exist. We wish we could give people food stamps, but people came in and they weren't eligible for food stamps in Texas yet. And we didn't have a system outside of just emergency food to sustain people. Healthcare was interrupted. Not only did people bring with them uh, their own health conditions from before the hurricane, but people were facing new conditions, kinds of exposures to contaminants that no one knew how to treat very well. We hadn't had a lot of experience with, and there was no national program that was helping to deal with that. And people in fact had no health care uh, of less of other than the emergency sort of health care for months until health care access got straightened out and it never did get completely straightened out. And we didn't have a robust safety net. All of these things come into play because, as, as Michael told us so clearly, we don't have more universal systems that could have sustained people even in the event of such a displacement. So I think both of those are the next areas for us to work in. What does it mean to sustain people in emergencies? What does it mean to sustain people when they're going through longer term periods of poverty and then what are the kinds of universal programs that keep people out of poverty and furthermore make it possible for them to stay out of poverty and to gain some of the wealth and security uh, that many of us have. Thank you. Thank you Laura. Um, our next speaker bringing us um, to the era of the Great Recession is Trina Shank. Thank you, Jenny. Next slide. There we go. Next slide. You might as well keep on going. <laughs> um, so I'm talking about the Great Recession, which actually took place between December 2007 and June 2009. This was 18 months. And after the Great Depression that Michael talked about, this was the longest lasting recession in recent U.S. history. GDP declined 4.3 percent during this time period. And for those of us who lived through this time, it was like a series of emergencies. So I'm going to try to recap some of the things that happened fairly quickly. So there was a period of low interest rates where um, the mortgage market expanded. And so there was a lot more total mortgage debt. There was also a lot of new innovative mortgage practices like subprime lending, adjustable mortgages, which allowed borrowers who in the past might not have been eligible to be eligible for mortgages. But it was based on the expectation that interest rates would stay low and then housing prices would continue to increase. And of course, that didn't happen. So between 2004 and 2006, interest rates began to rise, housing prices started to fall, um, and the adjustable mortgages started to rate set at higher rates, which made it harder for people to afford. So this was kind of the beginning of what was called a housing buzzle, bubble, and people who looked at this and studied it realized the housing market was um, in trouble. But um, unlike other times in the past, the housing market, it was much more connected to the financial markets. And this was because financial institutions looking for investment opportunities started to do market backed securities and sophisticated derivative products called credit debt swaps um, at unprecedented levels. So when the housing market started to collapse and housing markets started to go, by, um, go down, all of these financial securities also dropped in value. 
And so this housing crisis quickly turned into a credit crisis. Um, and, and the solvency of over leveraged banks that had these um, mortgage products that were no longer as valuable as they were on paper um, started to cause problems in the financial market. And this came to a head when Bear Stearns collapsed in 2000, uh, March of 2008. And at that point, um, the LIBOR rate started to rise and the cost of borrowing money started to increase. And so these, this housing crisis, followed by the financial crisis, um, led us to a prolonged period of uncertainty. Next slide. And what was interesting, next slide. And so what's interesting here, uh oh, stop. Okay, what's so interesting here right. is that, um, that first of all, Lehman Brothers collapsed. Um, and then the stock market on September 30th dropped almost 800 points. And then we started having a series of layoffs. So 60,000 people lost their jobs in a day. You'd see people walk out of office buildings with all the possessors and boxes, and you didn't know who was gonna get laid off next. It was a time of fear, next slide, a time of difficulty. Then we had the housing foreclosures started to rise, and you had whole developments that were started, but because the mortgage markets had tanked and people weren't buying new mortgages, never were lived in. They were just taped off and, and no one moved in um, for months and sometimes even a year at a time. Next next slide. Um, and the point that was made is that we want to bail people out and not banks because the, the call became if you're bailing out Wall Street and not Main Street, it's going to cause problems. But even though that call was made to bail people out. Um, the, the emphasis was on the financial markets. Next slide. So I'm going to try to go through all the things that were happening. So the housing price um, prices dropped over 30%. And this was even more than during the depression. Um, housing markets dropped very quickly um, and over a period of time. And then employment went from about 4.6 at the end of 2007 to over 10%. And even two years after the recession officially ended was as high as 9%. So rather than having a recession where the economy goes bad and unemployment goes up, the economy improves and unemployment goes down, um, it continued to be high unemployment or relatively high unemployment. Um, and then the, the federal government, the Federal Reserve had to even put guarantees, a million dollar guarantee just to, um, and sent J.P. Morgan Chase to take over Bear Stearns' assets when it collapsed. Um, then it gave a $182 billion bailout to a AIG, which was an insurance company that was thought to be too big to fail. And then they also had to prop up the housing market by giving loans to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And then um, companies had to have short-term loans and they moved from the money market to treasury bonds because that's the only thing that people trusted. Um, and so at that time, Secretary, uh, Treasury Secretary um, Henry Paulson and Federal Reserve Chair Ben Bernanke were paying very close attention to this situation because Ben Bernanke was a student of the Depression and saw that things were happening and didn't want the same thing to occur. So they were doing all these bailout packages to Congress. So next slide. And so um, in February 2008, there was an Economic Stimulus Act, and this is where they gave short-term tax rebate checks, so $600, $1,200 to individual households. They also gave some business provision to foster investment so that, the, um, so that investment wouldn't completely dry up. But then we had what was called TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. So that was passed in October 1st, right after the stock market collapsed. Um, and they were, um, and, and, the um, leaders of the Treasury and the Federal Reserve were given up to $700 billion um, to spend to prop up the financial system. They really only spent $440 billion and went to five areas. $245 billion went to buy bank preferred stocks as a way to give them cash so they wouldn't have um, liquidity problems. Um, almost $80 billion went to bail out the auto companies, primarily GM and Fiat Chrysler. $68 billion um, went to add to what was initially given to AIG to bring that up to $182 billion. $19.1 billion went to shore up credit markets. Um, and the banks repaid this um, back, and the government actually made a profit, but in the short term, that money was needed. Um, and then $30 billion went to a homeowner affordability and stability plan to um, modify mortgages. Um, and then when Obama 
stay, stay back. Um, when Obama got into office um, in 2009, he passed um, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. This was a series of tax cuts, stimulus checks, and what he called shovel ready public work product projects. Um, and actually, um, all of these federal responses were credited for taking what might have been another big depression and just having a recession. And even though it still took 18 months to recover, the financial system began to recover after that time. Next slide. And so, but my point I want to make is what happened after the recession. There's lots of things we could talk about, but the two things I want to emphasize for this talk is that inequality, which was already going up, increased even more, and that the most vulnerable groups were the ones who recovered more slowly. So Blacks, Latinos, young adults, people with limited skills and education. And I think what I want to say here is intersectionality is really important. So men who had limited skills in education um, took a long time to find jobs again, and oftentimes at lower wages than they had before. And then if you had Black young adult um, um, who had limited skills in education, they almost didn't enter the, um, the, the housing, I mean, the labor market at all. So for so intersectionally, some groups fared much worse than others. Next slide. And so what I'm going to try to do is quickly just give examples of this. It's hard to give the big picture because so much was going on. But if you look first at unemployment, looking at the period just before the recession, December 2007, and just after the recession, July um, 2011, almost every group doubled in unemployment. So whites went from four to eight, blacks went from nine to 16, Hispanics went from six to 11. But if you look at blacks and Hispanics, underemployment was even higher than unemployment. And even after the recession officially was over in 2009, these unemployment and underemployment numbers continued. Next slide. And what's important here is this little gray line at the to the right, which is a 2007-2009 recession, which showed the spike that went up. Um, people are saying that over the last couple years, we had a great increase in employment and much lower unemployment rates. But if you look at the numbers, even um, as of February 2020 or so, when we had like 3.3% unemployment for whites and 66 unemployment for blacks, the labor force participation and the number of people who are actually working, um, at least for blacks, never got back up to the pre-recession points. So even though unemployment looked low, um, labor force participation didn't recover. Next slide. And then if you look at this by age, the younger population, so those who were 16 to 24, just graduating from high school and college during the time of the recession, and even those who are a little older, um, those who are 25 to 34, um, their rate stayed pretty high even after the recession and was just starting to get back to pre-recession rates in the last year or so. And of course, we're having another crisis now. So some of them never fully um, engaged and entered kind of the labor market with a, a, a solid career pathway. Next slide. Um, and so what does this mean for income inequality? So um, if you see the spike between 2007 and 2009, there was a slight decrease in income for the top 1%, but they started you know, going up again or doing just fine and actually um, have a percentage of US income that's almost close to what we were around depression times. Next slide. And if you want to see what that means, that means the top 10% earn 10 times as much as those at the bottom. And that's nothing when you start looking at the top 1% and the top one-tenth of 1%. So we see that growth in income. It's really not the bottom 90% or even the 80th to the 95th percent. It's the top five, one, and one-tenth of 1% 1 that are just increasing in their income and everyone else is remaining stagnant. And next slide will show that. Next slide. So if you look at um, income, next slide. So if you look at income, the top 1% grew and, and then of, of earnings, the bottom and the middle pretty much stayed the same and um, stayed flat. Next slide. Um, and if you look at this by race, um, the disparities are huge. They remain. So as the economy goes up and down, income goes up and down, but um, Latinos and Blacks still stay at the bottom, sometimes 60 to 70% of the income of whites. Next slide. Um, and the real tragedy um, in terms of wealth and for sure is home ownership. So at 2004, blacks had just 
um, went over the 50% mark was the highest homeownership rates among the African American community. Um, and Latino, a little later, peaked around 2005, 2006. So Blacks and Latinos were finally getting to the point where their home ownership rates still weren't as high as whites, were but over 50%, and, and people who wanted to buy homes could. And then with the recession, um, those home ownership rates went down and haven't recovered again. Um, and what was interesting about this is that it wasn't just that people who were getting homes for the first time um, weren't buying homes or weren't being approved for loans. You had people who had been longtime homeowners or made a home that was inherited from their parents or grandparents who lost it during the session through foreclosure or through one of these subprime loans or through some sort of a um, 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 borrowing against your mortgage um, and they lost their home. So people who had had been homeowners um, for long periods of time also lost their home. So it was just a huge devastation in terms of home ownership for people of color. Next slide. Um, and then there are also um, less home ownership among younger populations. So those between the ages of 18 and 34 are less likely to own homes than they did before the recession 2005. And again, it's just been a decline. It hasn't recovered yet. Um, and one reason for this is that um, that credit markets became more difficult. It became harder to get mortgages. And so um, some people aren't even trying anymore. Next slide. And so um, these, these changes in home ownership um, lead to changes in, in wealth. Um, and again, if you look before the recession and after the recession, so 2000, 2011, um, the bottom three quintiles um, not only didn't recover, but are doing worse. So the bottom 20% went from negative to a lot more negative. The second quintile, um, their wealth holdings in terms of net worth divided in half and they haven't recovered. The third quintile almost got back up to pre-recession rates, but still haven't recovered. The only people who are doing better after the recession are those in the top 20 um, and top 40 percentiles. Next slide. Um, and then of course, um, wealth inequality by race was never good, um, even in the 80s, but it's getting worse. Um, and so after the recession, there was a decline for whites, but they started to recover. Blacks and Latinos um, had a decline and don't really have much to begin with and then haven't um, recovered. Next slide. And this is just showing it over time. Um, Blacks and, and Latinos um, have much lower um, home equity, um, much lower um, net worth, um, and, and whites are starting to recover, but Blacks and Hispanics are still pretty flat. Next slide. So what does this mean? Um, for the Great Recession in particular, because so much effort went to protect the financial markets and to kind of save the world from runs on banks and financial crises similar to the Great Depression, that those that were already, already well off or were heavily invested in stocks and business equity, they recovered not quickly, but in that 18 month period. Um, and in many cases, they're doing better than before, particularly if you're in the top 20%, um, top 1%. Um, but those who were regularly already struggling economically, the most vulnerable groups, they had lingering setbacks and in most cases have not returned to their pre-recession state. Um, and so federal response contributed to these disparate outcomes, these increases in inequality. And so in this current COVID-19 crisis, we can and must do better because we don't want inequality continue to um, increase and, and, and make the worst um, among us. Um, the ones who suffer the most. Next slide, I think I'm done. Oh, one, one, one slide though. Um, what this means though, is that as we um, become more Latino, um, more Asian, um, a majority um, country of color, um, if Latinos and Blacks are the ones who are doing much poorer in terms of income, in terms of assets, in terms of economic security, that means more and more of the country are gonna be economically unstable, economically insecure, and that's gonna affect the larger economy. That's it, thank you very much. I look forward to whatever questions we have. All right, thank you, Trina. Um, and I invite Laura and Michael to work on turning their microphones um, back on. If, if we were live in a room, um, I would be leading applause for all three of you. Um, but we're awkwardly silent in our social isolation here. So um, we do have some time left for questions. And I, I've seen a couple of questions arriving already via chat. Um, I invite our audience members to use the Q&A box for questions. Um, 
And I would like to start off, um, or, or the chat box, if for some reason you can't find the Q&A box, we'll be monitoring both at this point, um, or at least trying to. <laughs> um, but I'd like to um, start off with a question from all three of our panels, um, which is, th or all three of our panelists, which is to really to ask you to distill kind of a lesson from history that you see as most applicable to our to our current crisis, which really is, you know, each one of these was on a magnitude different than what America had experienced before. The Great Depression, Hurricane Katrina, the Great Recession, um, in terms of the broad, broad economic um, effects, in terms of the, the impact on a large region for Hurricane Katrina, and in terms of the way that markets were integrated so thoroughly um, during the Great Recession. So I'm, I'm curious about what lessons for history do you see in general? Um, and then thinking about Katrina's last slide, um, I may push you a bit as well um, to think about lessons for um, thinking about racial equity going forward. So that was a long and rambling question. Um, Michael, do you have some thoughts? Well, I'll I'll, I'll uh, respond. I think I think we're, you know, recently the federal government did in both fiscal and monetary policy is passing out. It's hard to, it's hard to get your mind around these numbers. Trillions of dollars. I mean, trillions of dollars. Now, in the current in the current environment, uh, very similar to the to the Great Recession. Almost all this money is going to corporations and to finance. Almost all of it. At this time, there are some checks going to households, and unemployment insurance has been expanded. So, so there is a little bit of the money that's now going to people, households, but most of it is going to business and to finance. So we have an op we have a an opportunity. There, there, the amounts of money are so vast that you could create universal basic income, you could create universal basic assets, you could do all kinds of things, but people are not putting this on the table. And instead, we're, we're doing pretty much what we did before. And, and really, as Trina pointed out, these so-called solutions to these crises are really increasing inequality. They, this is hard for people to get their minds around, but Government policy in these recent crises has generated inequality. And, and it's time to stop that. I mean, we should all be very clear about what's happening. And if the federal government is going to play this kind of role, this is not market functioning. This isn't like market economy. This is like taking public money and supporting wealthy people in a major way. That's what's happening. So we should be very clear about this and very clear about if, if this is public funds, it is, then all the people should be included. Every American should, should be supported, not just, not just wealthy Americans. So I think we have a lot of work to do. It's on, really, it's on us to do it. Uh, but if, if this isn't made clear, then I think a huge opportunity is, is being wasted here. Thanks. I agree. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that is definitely the story. Um, I think the other thing, though, is that a short term check for $1,200 or $1,700 or whatever this thing is going to be is just going to be a short term fix. So you can't say we're going to give a one time check for $1,700 to families and then bail out the airline industry or whatever industry we're going to bail out over time. Um, if this is extracted process, we have to think about extracted solutions that go across the board. Because even if um, we gave extended unemployment insurance, only certain people are eligible for unemployment insurance. Um, and so all the inequities that were already baked into our social safety net are just going to be continued. Um, and so, um, unless you're thinking about how to make everyone whole, then um, you're exacerbating inequalities. And I think um, 
if you want to point out what social workers could do on the ground, is kind of uphold these vulnerable groups, right? So um, locally, um, oftentimes we're saying, well, why aren't there better health precautions in the prison? Or why can't we let people who don't do violent crimes out um, early? Um, why can't we um, have people with um, pre-existing conditions who um, aren't going to be able to go to work immediately, even if the stay-at-home orders aren't going away, have some sort of special um, health care and um, um, kind of but anyways, it should be everybody as opposed to um, these kind of short term limited solutions that only hurt a small amount and doesn't look at the longer term. And I think just to follow up on, on Trina's comment to recognize how many of the solutions proposed for ordinary people and for people in poverty are in essence short term. That we expect uh, and that was true for the Katrina evacuees. That's true after the. Uh, the recession that we somehow expect people to sort of pick themselves up if they've lost the home that was the major family investment if they've lost you know their social network and all all that that entails and it's not a realistic view of it. Uh, and so the two kinds of things are the kinds of program that we need to keep our hand the kinds of programs that michael's talking about that try to get everyone stabilized from birth uh and if we're not doing that, the fact that we're going to have to be helping people for years, if not for generations, to undo the inequities that are in the systems now. We've actually had a question come in um, from Dylan at the University of Chicago. Uh, Dylan, I'm, I'm not going to pronounce your last name lest I, um, lest I butcher it, um, but, but it's an excellent question um, and one I think kind of speaks to one of the, the issues that we've seen a lot in U.S. history. Uh, Dylan writes, too often throughout U.S. history, we've seen laws passed that exclude people of color and other marginalized communities, either through explicit or de facto measures. And um, Michael, I'm sure this, you know, this is well-known history of the, um, of the New Deal um, in particular. Uh, Dylan's question, though, is how do you think we can build policy and research agendas that can guard against such exclusions in the current proposed policy, um, especially when we're already seeing exclusions, uh, for instance, in emergency paid family leave. Um, and I would add in some of the other um, workplace protections and mandates um, that are going on. So what can we do and kind of what, what exclusions may be coming up and what can we do about them? Um, Michael, yeah, turn your audio on there. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's on, right? Yeah. So in the current crisis, we have the essential worker issue. So people are going out to work and disproportionately, these are low income people of color who are who are supporting the rest of us while we all protecting it. Well, you know, we're all protected and work from home and so on. So this this is a pattern that continues. I, I really think I'm, I'm pessimistic about this, but I really think that the key to this is is creating a democratic as in democracy uh, process so that people of color can vote without without having their votes suppressed. So that I think there's a lot of work to do on the on the democracy side of, you know, can people's voices be heard uh, that that should be a it has been historically been a a major social work focus and and has to be again but pe people have to be have to be heard to be able to 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 speak up for their for their well-being i will say one example of that i'm going to step out of my moderator hat and into my um, bragging about former student hat here um, the united food and commercial workers in washington state had secured some uh, an emergency pay bump for their frontline workers who are grocery workers and meat cutters um, in the state. And their state uh, legislative vice president um, is an MSW and an alum of our policy practice concentration here. Yes, so um, I imagine she's way too busy to be watching this webinar right now, but uh, shout out to um, the folks who are MSWs working um, with the labor, labor community.
To build upon Michael's point that we're spending trillions of dollars, I, I wish that you would kind of give the magnitude of how many people work for how long in the CCC and the WPA. Because sometimes you hear those things, you see the posters, like, oh, you know, that was a long time ago. But I mean, it was millions of people over a long period of time. And so what would be the kind of equivalency today if you can kind of extrapolate? Well, well, before I answer that specifically, I did I did see a, an estimate of the total cost of the New Deal programs uh, in the 1930s that even adjusted for today's dollars don't come to even one trillion dollars. So the amount the amount of money that we're spending now is 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 massive beyond anything that has ever been done in domestic policy, but with no vision. So, so I think I think it's important to remember that the W the WPA at any one time had had uh, it varied, but it had about three million people. I think sometimes as many as five million, and people would work for years. I mean, it was a it was a long term employment program. Um, I don't think many people worked the whole you know eight or nine or ten years of the of the depression, but it was you know for long periods of time. Uh, in the Civilian Conservation Corps, young people would sign up for one year and could re-up for two. Some of them were able to re-up for another year. So it was a period of usually one, two, or three years. Uh, I think the total number of, of CCC uh, enrollees over the, over the whole course between 1933 and 1941, when it, or 1942 when it ended, was in the, in the few million, so four or five million, something like that. So you have to remember that those numbers today, if you if you adjusted that by population size, then this would those numbers would be probably um, this is a rough guess, maybe three times larger than that uh, in today's labor force. Hey, we're getting some more questions coming in, so I'm going to um, pivot a little bit. Um, we had a question from Jesse June. Uh, Yun, uh, which is what new social work or public policy challenges? do you foresee in the coronavirus pandemic compared to the Great Depression, Katrina, or the, the global recession? So what, what's different, um, particularly for social workers in the current environment, and how could we think about addressing that? Laura, do you have yeah, I guess just thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm thinking of that what we might have, have learned and what's specific here. And I think one of, I, you know, I often think when we think about investment accounts and other kinds of accounts for families, that there are also several mainstays of family life that very few except the highest earners can actually afford on the marketplace. And one of those is health care. And we're watching now how divergent it is, the kind of care people can get, how they get it, how they learn whether they're sick or not. Um, and it seems to me that that's a problem that has become much more visible now and that social workers can really look on what this healthcare nationally need to look at, like uh, avoid not just this kind of catastrophe, but the kind of inequities that have been persistent forever uh, under our sort of marketized healthcare program. Right, but the link between health and your ability to maintain your own health yeah. and and the public well-being, I think, is more clear than it has been. Then, exactly. But I think you see the same kind of thing in access to support for child care and access to subsidized housing is that we, um, that it's very, uh, it's so limited that it can't really stabilize a, a family or a household's need in that arena. My one thought on, on this is that, um, first of all, it really is nationwide and worldwide. Um, and not that the depression didn't have worldwide effects, but I mean, each nation and each kind of community kind of did their own thing for a while. But really, we all are facing the health challenge, plus the fact that certain industries are completely stalled for who knows how long. Um, and that makes it a lot tougher. And so um, in addition to things that are universal, I think that we just need to think a lot more collectively. Um, and so, for example, um, 
One of our students, I'll give a plug to one of our students, um, has, has um, you know, put out a, 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 a call line and people are calling in mostly for seniors who, you know, are, are health compromised and can't go get food, can't go get um, medicine. And so um, takes like 500 to 1,000 calls a week and then has people, you know, respond to the calls and then drop a box of food or, or pick up their prescription medicine and make sure they get it. Um, and so this person is going all over, you know, Southeast Michigan, which is like 60, 70 miles. And so, but then another church or another social service agency is doing it in the other corner, right? And so it seems like rather than having all these emergency or do it yourself or what you could kind of come up with on your own to kind of fix something that really is a universal need, figuring out how to, to think about these things more collectively um, and um, have good advice that's collective. I mean, the fact that right now each governor is for his or herself, sometimes each mayor <laughs> is for his or herself, um, and and what confusion that causes. Um, and even though advertise it, it says we're all in this together, we're not really all in this together and figuring out how to be more collective so that we can actually um, have the maximum amount of both health um, and recovery. And I don't think anybody, one has the authority or is thinking that big. That makes sense. Yeah. And this is also a moment where pre-existing organizing efforts have, have yielded networks um, that can respond. You know, my, my guess is your student just didn't invent that out of thin air, that the resources, the, the social capital necessary to make that happen was something that had been in place and was coming out of organization prior to that. So um, we've had a question here. Um, oh, Laura, go on. I was gonna say one of the problems we have when we depend, and this came, became very visible in Katrina, when you depend on local networks and local helping arrangements, is that the nature and the depth of resources varies by the income levels of communities. And so it actually, the dependence on informal, more localized networks can contribute to the inequality both in what's received and in the strength of the recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a question come in from my colleague, Diana Pierce at the Center for Women's Welfare here at the University of Washington. Um, and Diana writes, evidence suggests that the Great Recession just deepened and hastened the inequality in the labor market as it shifted from manufacturing to the service sector. What about reducing people's costs and inequalities by universalizing healthcare, Childcare, housing, and the like. Uh, Michael, uh, unmute and then then share. I'll uh, I'll step in. It's good to hear a question from Diana Pierce, who's been who's been doing good work for a long, long time. Um, I I would I would say that. Um, I, I would, I would, going back to basics here. I think that the, the the industrial era idea that social policy was 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 basically fill in when an industrial job did not provide a sufficient wage. I mean, that's kind of the the structure of our. It's kind of supplemental, and the basic assumption is that the labor market will will support most families well, and then social policy can kind of pick up the pieces. I think this assumption is not likely to be very functional going forward. It's not functional now. We we have labor markets that do not, and I think will not support tens of millions of families. Um, so we have we have to think pretty differently about about what what sustains family social welfare. And that, and I, and I fully agree that universal health care, universal child care, essentially an expansion of public goods uh, in various social arenas is obviously uh, a part of that picture. I also think that relying solely on building, on, on creating sufficient family income and not thinking about what families accumulate is, is has to change. So I think I think this starts with we don't have we don't have industrial labor markets anymore. We that you know that that era has passed and the kind of jobs that we have created and are creating more so is a lot of jobs that don't support households. 
if that's the environment, then we have to have social policies that respond to those circumstances. And also, I think that recognize that the nature of what's being provided, I mean, the cost of health care is significantly different than it was a generation ago. Uh, and very few households could support that for themselves, whether or not they had an industrial job. All of us are dependent on some additional support. We have just a few minutes left, um, so I'm going to give each of our speakers um, an opportunity to to give their last word um, in the in the form of advice or a to do list. So um, I'll, I'll I'll let you choose your own adventure here. Um, but what do you think, frontline social worker practitioners or those in movement agency or leadership positions should be doing, or what should we who are social welfare scholars and um, people teaching the next generation of social workers, who, who should be doing what in, in these days, and what can we what can we do to forge a path that um, leads to greater equity going forward? So just one small question. That's it. <laughs> Michael, do you want to lead us off since you're unmuted? Uh, okay. So I, I I will say that that. The, the clearest thing in my view that should be done in America now is to elect some leaders who are going to be leaders for the whole country and think about how the country develops. And uh, I don't care what political party you think that is. I just think that ought to be the guiding, the guiding principles. So we don't now, in my view, have leadership that will solve these problems. For those of you who are at the Society for Social Work and Research meeting this past um, winter, our theme was, you know, voting is social work and elections are social work. So that's good advice. Laura or Trina? Let me follow up on that because I think not only do we need that kind of leadership, but we need to educate ourselves about the powerful way that the federal government can work uh, for a more general public good and expect it to do that and to pay for it. And I think building upon that note, thinking about universal platforms for needs that aren't well covered by the, the, the labor market. So how to take care of children, how to take care of the elderly, how to take care of the environment. Um, and so if both federal monies and platforms could seriously take on those issues, and not just, as Michael said, you know, the residual of what isn't paid for by individual labor for those who can afford it, but if we see that Every child needs, you know, care and support up until, you know, whatever adulthood is these days. Many people who are no longer able to work, whether because of disabled or because of their age, should have, you know, um, dignity. Um, and so retirement and, and Social Security does that to some extent, but for health care, not so much. Um, and then in the environment, you know, why should it be that people who are poor are in places where there's toxins and no supports and flooding comes in and, you know, air pollution and asthma and all the other things that come through it, as opposed to we want an environment that's good for everybody. Um, and so even if it's just those three things, we have universal <laughs> platforms, then maybe the labor market can fill in the other things. But those are things that we haven't been doing very well for a long time. And, um, and if we start thinking about those, that could be at least a place to have the most vulnerable. But obviously in this short term with the COVID-19, many people can still no longer work or won't be able to work in the same ways they have in the past. So there's so much restructuring that's gonna go on, thinking about how you can bring everybody in so they have an, a, enough to live on and can think about their futures. Social work is, is fundamentally the work of what the market doesn't do well. Um, and, and this is an era where the markets are facing um really new challenges and and we need we need a social response to to create our well-being so thank you um to all three um of our speakers um we're just about to close up before we leave however um i want to invite you all to join us um next week again same time same place probably your living room um, <laughs> Um, to think about um, housing policy um, and how people who are and aren't housed, um, how home ownership um, and rentals, renters' rights are going to be maintained.
um, over this period. So next week's um, webinar, uh, so far this is a series of two, but next week's will be co-sponsored um, with Grand Challenge on ending homelessness um, and will feature speakers looking at, at policy related to housing and homelessness. So thank you so much um, to all of you out there who attended and spent some of your time uh, with us today. Um, we did record this and we will get it posted to the Social Work Grand Challenges um, webpage. Uh, so we encourage you to think about sharing it uh, with your colleagues. We'd love to see students um, thinking through these issues, whether they're still in the, the final weeks of the term or heading into a summer term. Um, we also encourage you, if you're not already in touch with our um, grand challenge on ending or on reducing extreme economic instability, you can follow us on Twitter here. We also have a Facebook page. I don't have uh, the link there, but um, you can follow us on social media and stay attuned of um, the events we are doing. Um, so once again, thank you all. We, we don't know the path forward. No one knows, um, but I'm thrilled to have had social workers from around the country and, and my esteemed panel of thinkers here today uh, to help us think about creating a path forward for greater equity. So thank you all. Bye-bye.